actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. It breaks my heart to hear that for you because I know the courage that it took to put these words together and to be playing them for the world, let alone a pastor. So thank you for, for trusting me with this. Um, thank you so much for being willing to listen to it. That was really scary. <laughs> I'm glad that we're in a church he hearing these words because the reality is that so many people, young girls especially, who have filled buildings like this, have experienced this trauma and continue to. You were how old when this happened? 14. As a pastor, I wish I could sit with 14 year old Tilly, Grace, yeah. and say, you didn't do anything wrong. The injury that you received, that was bad enough, but it was the subsequent damage from people who profess faith in a God of love. So I feel burdened to apologize for people who should have been there. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. But I, I'm grateful for your courage to, to share this because uh, it's going to help so many people. And I hope that it's, that it's been healing for you. What's it been like to give these words to the world? There's been, you know, a lot of young girls commenting on it and yeah. using the audio. I knew that this happened, obviously. I didn't think I was unique in this happening to me. But I didn't know how much yeah. this was happening and that it's still happening this abuse of power is just so rampant within the church. It's been hard to digest that and take on other people's similar pain. I think this kind of abuse of power happens everywhere, but when it happens in the church, it's, it's particularly infuriating because this is supposed to be a community based on seeing the inherent value in all people and, yeah. and loving people. But then you see the internalized misogyny that's built into the institutional church. You see the toxicity of purity culture and the way that often demonizes women and it insulates men. We need more artists and more people to just speak that out and make people aware because it's the only way that culture changes, that the church changes. It's why I do the work that I do because we have to confront ugliness about what the church has been. Yeah, and I think actually, especially after this happened to me, I was so desperate mm -hmm. and depressed and suicidal, to be honest. Sure. And my parents didn't even know. I had no friends because I stopped hanging out with the girls that took me to this house right. to be assaulted. And I actually turned back into Christianity, but it was very much like my own relationship with God and yep. Jesus. Yep. And you know, the stories that I read about Jesus, I'm like, this guy sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, like he's so accepting and you know, I'm not amazing at the facts and historical data, which you can chime in on. But from what I've heard, like his, some of his first followers were prostitutes and diseased people and the people mm. that had been ostracized That's right. from society. And he was like, y'all out of everyone need the love the most. Yeah, there's a time in the Bible where Jesus is looking at the religious leaders who are criticizing the kinds of people that Jesus is with. And he says to them, the, the prostitutes and the sinners are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you, meaning they get it. They're with me and we are in relationship together and we're equals. And it's you who use religion and power to place yourself above. You're missing it. And so that's- Wow, that's, he said that? Yeah. Wow. That's the, the sad part of, of your story, especially for a minister, is that the church should be the place where misogyny is gone, where in inequities are gone, and yet it's the place where it too often shows up. Why do you think that is, you know, like even with these comments, at first it was like really authentic, genuine, loving Christians. And they were mm -hmm. like, well, we're so sorry this happened to you. God still loves you. We love you. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, like yeah. I'm seeing the people that actually embody that message. But then it started to shift and it started to be people like you're wicked, repent to God. And I'm like, where are the priorities? You know, I'm wicked for calling out abuse within the church. Mm. What about the wickedness in the story, in the person within the church that assaulted me? That's right. And also the Christian moms that bullied me mm. and didn't support me. 
and yeah. slut shame little girls. Where do you think that message got lost? Well, I think we all have a story that we tell ourselves about who we are, about our own goodness, and we all want to be the good person in the story. And so when you bring something to light like you have, the response is, I'm going to defend the system that I'm a part of. I'm going to relieve myself from any responsibility to confront ugliness or to change myself. So the easier thing is, I'm going to blame the victim. I'm going to figure out how to make this about their immorality. And that is, again, something Jesus condemns. You know, he says to the people who are the stone throwers, you are in no place to do this. And they drop their stones and they walk away. But we all want to feel like we're the good people. So that's the tragedy of it, is that so often when vulnerable victims of abuse of any kind step forward, the response is not, let's embrace you. It's let's put you at a distance and embrace the system. Yeah. You know? I don't really identify as a Christian, but I identify as a spiritual person. Yeah. Um, I think it's just too hard for me to identify with any organized religion at this point. Right. But I feel like I have a connection to God and like the God that I know is so loving and so accepting. My brother passed away a few years ago and that was another really, really challenging moment in my life where again, I really felt suicidal and I had met some people from a church actually at Coachella. Sounds so LA, <laughs> but they were like, oh, do you want to come to this Justin Bieber church event? And I was like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I went and met people from the church there and they got my number and the following week, it was a Wednesday. My partner was away. I was home alone. <sighs> you know, I had looked up how I was gonna commit suicide mm. and I received a text message at that point from someone at that church and she said hey what are you doing right now mm. and I wasn't gonna be like hey about to kill myself <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no. be right back yeah. yeah I was like oh nothing what's going on and she's like come to church right now because mm. they did their service on Wednesday nights and it, it saved my life it saved my, I really took that as a divine message. That's amazing. And I know that God is with me. And I know, like, I really feel like God saved me that night. Mm. And I went to that church and they were incredible. I started to see this new side of Christianity that I had never experienced. I remember one of the sermons being about shame and shaming people and how toxic that is. Yeah. That how, like, nothing good comes from shame and feelings of unworthiness. Yeah. You know, that doesn't encourage you to want to change and be a better person. Yeah, that's right. It just starts this negative toxic spiral of like, I'm not good enough, why even bother? And I just don't understand mm. why that has become such a primary, I feel like, feeling amongst the church. Well, it's an easy weapon um, because if you want to control people, make them feel less than, make them feel like they don't quite deserve what you have so that they feel like they have to earn it. And I don't know if your experience when you were younger made you feel that this was people doing it or did this actually influence how you viewed God? I never thought it was God, to be honest. That's good. I never thought it was God. I've always felt a very strong connection to a God mm -hmm. and that, that God to me is love. You know, that's why that's I right. love your shirt. Love is my religion. Yeah, yeah. Like that's what I feel. And in the song where it says like Jesus hated grace, it was set up with that conversation mm -hmm. that's in the intro of like, hey Karen, and it's the mom sure. and she's talking garbage and gossiping and yeah. all that. And so I wanted to put in the song like, according to you, Jesus hated grace, but it was like, yeah. <laughs> come on. The gospel yeah. according to Karen, yeah, yeah. that's right. You no, know, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm not talking about sure. like actual God and it's, it's really about those people, the Karens and the people that call themselves Christians mm -hmm. while judging and gossiping. And it did make me feel a little bit like not good enough, not because of God, but within my own community. And sure. that's incredibly isolating. And while a lot of religion is about the afterlife and surely you know, there's something worth living for in this life. Well, and I think the hard part for many young people, they're in a church environment and all the messages they're getting are from people in that environment. So if that environment says you're inherently sinful or you're dirty or you should be ashamed, it's difficult to figure out how do I find my identity outside of that. And that's why a religion that lacks love lacks Jesus. For God to be God, then that is an entity that loves in a way that we can't fathom that accepts in a way that we can't even accept. And so whenever anyone who represents religion says, I'm going to push you away, 
they're doing something that is antithetical to the heart of God. That's what I, I really regret about your experience and so many people who might be watching this. And I hope that they realize that is not of God, it is of people who are flawed and failing. And if you can get past that, if you can get through that, then you can embrace the love that God has for you. That's so amazing to hear. And that's kind of like my point with this whole song. I don't want it to be misinterpreted that I'm trying to hate on Christianity because I'm, I'm not. Yeah. My problem that I want to call out and I want to address is the hypocrisy that can be found within the church and some people that call themselves Christians that yeah. aren't really enacting that message of unconditional love and acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's the God that I believe in. And here's the thing, if you are a human being who is a person of faith and has deep empathy, you shouldn't be angered by a song like yours. You shouldn't feel confronted. You should feel like this is now my responsibility. I should be speaking. I should be coming alongside people who've been damaged. That is what Jesus people should be doing, yeah. right? So um, I'm hoping amazing. that more people do. Yeah, thank you so much for being willing to do this. I'm tearing up, you know, especially that last part you said. I mean, that's all I could hope for. And it, yeah. it really means a lot that you were willing and brave enough, truly such like a messenger of, of love and God's love to, to listen to this and what? talk about this ugliness that's happening. Well, I am just honored to be with you and be in a church and have this kind of redemptive conversation. And uh, thank you for just being courageous enough to write the song and to sing the song. Thank you. Can I give you a hug? Yes, okay. absolutely. <laughs> it's a what? Mm -hmm.